Canada to this adult uh, Bible class. We are grateful that you have brought each and every one of us here. And we just pray for a meaningful time of uh, learning together from your word. Uh, again, we thank you that our brother Stephen has availed himself to lead us through uh, this study of Second Peter, and we just pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to lead and guide him, and also open our hearts and our minds to even in, in understanding uh, uh, your word uh, that you have uh, uh, written through uh, your Apostle Peter. So we just want to thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to learn together, and we pray that you will uh, continue to guide us even as we uh, learn from your word this morning. We pray and ask all this, giving you thanks in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, over to you, Stephen, uh, if you unmute yourself, and then we can begin the study. Good morning, everyone. And um, this morning, we're going to be having our final session on Second Peter, <clears throat> living in the light of Christ's return. And this is Session number six, the urgency of passing it on. Um, we're going to spend half an hour uh, on, on, on the material. And then we're going to have, uh, we're going to break into groups. Uh, Yashon would break us into groups to discuss uh, some questions that, are, that is in the final slide. And you can take um, a snapshot of it or a photograph of it for your uh, discussion later. So that this being the final uh, session, we want to have some time for um, mutual edification through our study on, on Second Peter. So right now, the urgency of passing it on. Right, so let's have a bit of a recap of a portrait of a faithful believer. If you are a faithful believer in the Lord, then this, portrait would describe uh, you. So a, a faithful believer is a beneficiary of God's precious and great promises. Uh, we, last week, we talked about the patronage system, the patron-client system that was very well established in uh, the ancient Greco-Roman world, whereby the patron would... Um, uh, would lavish blessings upon the um, upon upon the client, uh, and the clients uh, repay that grace, so to speak, by bringing glory uh, and honor to the patron, and never bring uh, a dishonor um, uh, or shame to the patron because this is an honor and shame uh, system in, of society. And so thinking from that um, worldview, uh, using that worldview, the biblical authors, especially here in Second Peter, really capitalizes on that worldview to describe God as our great benefactor who have bequeathed to us or rather have lavished upon us uh, uh, precious and great promises that is completely out of God's grace, uh, not out of our own merit. So, uh, in part, it is a faith that is of equal standing with the apostles. By placing our trust in Jesus, we have obtained a faith that is of equal standing with the apostles. And that is very, very meaningful. There is no reason for us to say that we are inferior. There's no reason to think of ourselves as, um, as uh, not having what it takes spiritually. Uh, uh, there's no need to hero worship the apostles uh, because the faith that we have obtained is of equal standing with the apostles. But it is not the incip incipient faith that is what uh, God, all that God wants from us. Rather, he has made us partakers of the divine nature. So a faithful believer is also a partaker of the divine nature. Again, a uh, partaker of the divine nature does not mean uh, that you 
become God in the sense that you become an object of worship, you become all-powerful, you become omniscient or uh, deserving of worship, of adoration, uh, nothing of that sort. But rather, it speaks to God's moral character that you are uh, partaking. You, because it is uh, qualified by that uh, we become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from uh, uh, the corruption in the world due to sinful desire. So it's basically about the escape from worldliness due to sinful desire. I must clarify, I do not mean escape from the world uh, and, and go off the grid, uh, so to speak. Uh, rather, we need to be engaged with the world by confronting the world with a life that is that successfully escaped from the worldliness that is due to sinful uh, desire. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. And precisely because we are not of the world, that Christ has sent us into the world to confront the sins of the world. Uh, but of course, in order to do that, we first must, of course, escape from worldliness that is due to sinful desire. And the way to do that is by partaking of the divine nature. Uh, that is basically to galvanize the faith, the incipient faith that we have with virtue and with the list of qualities uh, that is listed out in chapter one. Okay. So then we talk about living in the light of the second coming of Christ. How then do we live our lives uh, knowing that our benefactor will return, knowing that the patron, we will meet the patron again? Uh, what glory do we bring to him and what does he want out of us? So we are to compound once incipient faith with godly qualities and continually practice these qualities and grow in them, to grow in godliness, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, uh, to have this personal, uh, intimate uh, uh, relationship with Jesus Christ by beholding him, we partake of his nature. And when we, as we do that, we become conformed to his image, uh, be because that is what the Holy Spirit is working within us to do. When I talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, I do not mean uh, primarily the spectacular. Uh, primarily, I mean the, uh, the, the giving up of more territory in our life, giving up of more territory in our heart to the indwelling spirit. So uh, we begin our life with us being in control. Uh, our heart uh, loves whatever our heart loves, our heart thinks of whatever our heart thinks of, our heart chooses whatever our heart uh, chooses. We are enthroned in our hearts to make decisions, uh, to, to reign over our own lives. Um, uh, but when, but when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into our life to indwell us. Now, having been now that we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, we must not sequester Him to just one corner of our heart. Uh, for example, Sunday morning, that is where our heart is turned to Him. But rather, we want to progressively surrender more and more territory of our heart to God uh, and uh, uh, to the work of the Holy Spirit. And as the Holy Spirit uh, takes possession of more and more space in our heart, we become more and more transformed into the image of Christ. And that is, uh, uh, that is accomplished through continually practicing these qualities and growing in them, or in the words of Paul, to walk by the Spirit, and when you walk by the Spirit, you shall by no means give in to the dictates of the flesh. You will 
by no means give in to the flesh. And that is what it also means to partake of the divine nature and thereby escape from worldliness due to sinful desire. So then the secret then, the trick so to speak, is not about I do not want to be worldly, I don't want to be worldly, I don't want to sin, I don't want to sin, and to resist that sin, but rather it is to continually grow in Christ, to enjoy him, to look at him, to, uh, 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 to behold him, to partake of the divine nature, uh, and in your enjoyment of him, in your uh, participation of his nature, in your um, uh, uh, coming into contact with him, and you're so enamored by his presence that uh, you just do not sin as a result. Uh, and whenever we commit sin, we know that that is because we have left the position of fellowshipping with Christ to uh, uh, having left that position, therefore we sin. And the, un the antidote that is that having confessed our sin, we return to this position of uh, fellowship and remain, abide in Christ and he in us, for apart from him, we can do nothing. Uh, so I talk about how uh, we, we, we can do things by the flesh. That is basically to just give in to sin, or we can try to overcome sin uh, by our own strength, uh, whether by, for example, law keeping, uh, thou shalt not this, thou shalt so we keep on reminding ourselves never to murder, never to commit adultery, never to steal, never to uh, bear false witness, never to covet, uh, ne never to have a covetous heart. We can keep reminding ourselves that and, and whenever uh, temptation arises, we try to subdue that uh, temptation by, uh, the, by willing it to happen, by willing uh, by buffeting the flesh, uh, the body, so to speak, uh, uh, asceticism or whatever other means that you, you, you employ in order to not sin, uh, those would be uh, depending on your natural self, uh, depending on yourself rather than on the Holy Spirit. And the most scary thing would be if you succeed. If you were to succeed in... Uh, uh, reining in your sin, your, your, your sinful desire by your own natural strength, uh, that become a basis for pride, that becomes a basis for a life that is independent of God. And interestingly, that would be uh, breaking, uh, that would be sinning against God as well, because you shall have no other gods before me, including yourself, you shall have you shall not be a god unto yourself or have idols in your life. For example, maybe you attended some kind of a, a workshop or or a, a seminar that uh, uh, that that becomes something that you depend on in order to not sin, right? So that depending on that technique. Uh, that, that is apart from Christ is idolatrous because you are saying that uh, 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 my savior is not Christ alone. The one who saved me from my sins uh, include uh, this uh, a product that uh, processes uh, that, was, that was taught to me by some guru. Uh, so you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not worship any idols. Uh, so you continually practice these qualities, these Christ-like qualities, and grow in them by uh, coming to Christ over and over again. And we also talked about uh, living in the light of the second coming of Christ by discerning and overcoming false teachings. Uh, false teachings tries to dilute the gospel of Christ, append to the gospel of Christ, add things to the gospel of Christ, uh, or de de reduce, uh, remove things from the uh, gospel of Christ, uh, such that your faith is placed in something else, uh, or your hope is for something else, other than the gaining of Christ himself, 
more and more uh, throughout your life. So we need to have the wherewithal to discern and overcome false teachings because false teachings allows us into a sense of security, stupefies us to what is truly going on. Uh, that is that Christ, that history is rushing towards the second coming of Christ and we become like a dicycle spiritually uh, and, uh, as, a, as a result. Uh, and so we need to know the scriptures and to, to, to know what is the teaching of the Bible uh, uh, and also to pursue holiness. Uh, and that is part of discerning and overcoming false teachings. Uh, wait for and hastening the coming of the day by living holy lives and teaching others to do the same. Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day by living holy lives and teaching others to do the same. I wouldn't do the teaching others to do the same, which is living in the light of one's physical death. Now, the second coming of Christ, why is it delayed with inverted commas, delayed? It is because God is patient with us and does not want any one of us to perish. So give us enough time to repent, but eventually that time will run out. So uh, there are two ways the time run out. One is Christ comes back. Two is we uh, go to be with Christ. That is, if Christ does not come back in our lifetime, then what? All right? Then what? So living in the light of one's physical death could be the alternative uh, title of today's uh, message. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 to 15. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right as long as I'm in this body to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Now, throughout uh, Peter's life, he probably thought that Christ would return in his lifetime. And so he went about practicing these qualities and he went about preaching about them, uh, establishing churches, strengthening the believers. Uh, and now he, the Lord has revealed to him, made clear to him that he will not come back uh, uh, before Peter's own death. That is to say, Peter will soon die uh, and his death would precede the second coming of Christ. So then he is burdened in his heart to write Second Peter, knowing that he will soon die. So therefore he makes he I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. And this is the right attitude that we must have that our ministries does not die with us, uh, rather that we um, uh, would make every effort to, so that after our death, those under our charge spiritually will be able to, uh, to continue in growing in these qualities. So I repeat verse 12, therefore I intend, I intend always, always, so sometimes people say old people are very repetitive and they get repetitive and they uh, nag you over and over and over again. Uh, but it is true. And now Peter is like an old man uh, and he is right here nagging them, right? I mean, look at this passage. He's nagging them. I intend always to remind you. Uh, don't, don't say that you're sick and tired of these reminders. Why are you always repeating the same thing? Well, uh, so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Look at how he, he uh, three times he talks about this in this passage, isn't it? In time, always to remind you, even though you know them already. No, just because you already know them doesn't mean I'm not going to remind you, all right? Just because you, have, uh, you are established in the truth, that doesn't mean I do not remind you. In fact, he goes on to say, to stir you up by way of reminder a second time. And then the third time, 
and that he will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. So in just this uh, few verses, three times he's telling them, I'm reminding you, I'm reminding, I'm going to die soon. I'm going to die soon. I'm going to remind you. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm just going to keep on repeating, 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 repeating. And if you find what I'm saying right now repetitive, it is intended to be that way, all right? To see whether you get sick of uh, being reminded of it or not. And he's not finished. This is chapter one. So uh, make every effort to remind others to live holy lives so that they would do so even after one's death. So our ministry doesn't end with our death. Our, our, we need to ensure that those under our spiritual care need to continue to do so even after our departure. Uh, in chapter three, he is doing it again. This is now after he talks about Chapter two talks about the false teachers. So after chapter two, after talking about the false teachers, he, he writes again, this is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved, in both of them. So he wrote them once and he's writing to them again, right? And in both of these writings, letters, a letter after another letter to stir you up, uh, your sincere mind by way of reminder. All right, reminder. So another reminder that you should be reminded that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and save it through your apostles. Uh, and these holy prophets, that is the Old Testament, the apostles, that is the New Testament. This refers to the entire Bible, all 66 books of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. You need to know, you need to remember what is in the Bible. Of course, in order to remember what you need, uh, what is in the Bible, you need to know what is in the Bible. You need to be established in the truth. That is what he said earlier. Knowing this, first of all, that uh, scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing following their own sinful desires, which is to say, we need to make every effort to equip others with the word of God so that they too can overcome false teachings and sin. So I say that this one is about the urgency of passing it on. Um, and, and, and I find this to be uh, a, uh, something that I, I have been thinking more and more about since the beginning of, of this pandemic, that we can always preach a sermon, we can always uh, have activities, uh, we can have a, a fun Easter and Christmas family camp and all these things are very good and we should have them and, uh, and, and uh, hopefully soon as this pandemic season is over, uh, we will be able to return to those activities. But I think that we also need to uh, focus on what is real. What is real is that Christ is coming back again and, uh, and uh, we need to leave in the light of Christ's uh, return. It is not just a doctrine. It is not a theory. Uh, it, it is reality. It is not some, It is not just about knowledge. Uh, I, 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 right? I can tell you X, Y, and Z, but that this is something that will happen in space-time reality. And, and, and so there is an eternal future to reckon with, and there is a hefty price to pay if the Lord comes back and find us one thing. So that is why he, Peter thinks that he's going to die. And before he dies, he must write this letter to remind them, which I think, and since this is the second letter, I think that he has always been constantly doing that, whether he was about to die or not. So living in the light of the second coming of Christ, living in the light of one's physical death, because we are beneficiaries of God's great promises, God's precious and great promises. This is the portrait of, uh, of a faithful believer with Peter as an example uh, who, uh, who exemplifies uh, uh, such faithfulness. So the urgency of passing it on, and as we consider what the, the, the people who just left us in, in, uh, uh, to be with the Lord in the past uh, three years, uh, also, uh, we have Billy Graham, uh, 
we have Ravi Zacharias who died this year. Last year, we have Norman Geisler, Warren Wisby. Uh, we have David Paulson, R.C. Pro. Uh, we have these teachers of the word that I believe many of us uh, benefit from uh, teaching us to live lives that are pleasing to the Lord, teaching us to live lives to be holy to the Lord uh, and, and um, explaining to us what the gospel of Christ is. And they have passed on. And soon, and that's one whole generation. Uh, people that we all grow up listening to um, benefiting tremendously and they've gone to be with the Lord. And as I consider this matter, then we have to think about what really is important for us uh, to do. Why is there an urgency of passing it on? Because we do not know when our time is up. And we need to aspire that before our time is up, that we fulfill our ministry. And that include uh, not just doing that ministry ourselves, but that we pass it on to others. But about the ministry, it is not about the external that matters. The point of ministry is to minister Christ to people deep within uh, so that they would bear uh, spiritual fruit, uh, so that they would be mature in Christ. Uh, it is not enough for us to just pursue personal spirituality. It is great, me and Jesus, me and Jesus, me and Jesus. I enjoy reading the Bible on my own. I enjoy uh, 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 spending time with the Lord on my own. Uh, but we need to make sure that what we have learned from the Lord is passed on to the next generation. Frankly, everything that, most things that we learn from the Bible about the Lord, we build it upon the shoulders of giants that went before us and they were not selfish with the knowledge of Christ, insights into the mysteries of Christ that they have gained, but they, they have selflessly taught others the same. Uh, instead of saying, it's just me and Jesus, me and Jesus, uh, rather they take the time to disciple others and preserve for us their knowledge of the Lord so that we can learn from them and uh, don't have to start from scratch, reinvent the wheel. Uh, 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 and, and so we should do the same for the generation that comes. So in general, we need to disciple the next generation by promoting biblical literacy, healthy doctrines, and the worldview that is conscious of Christ's imminent return. So three things that I feel that we need to disciple the next generation. Number one is that they need to know the Bible uh, from page to page. They need to have read the whole Bible. We need to do a survey, I suppose, of how, how many of us have read the Bible from cover to cover, every page of it. Uh, how much of it do we retain? Are we biblically literate? If we are not, it's very easily to be swayed by unbiblical teachings. We thought that, oh, what you're teaching seems to come from the Bible, but Maybe it does not come from the Bible. Healthy doctrines, the truths uh, that Christian teachers, Bible teachers have taught for generations, the truth about who God is, who Christ is, who the Holy Spirit is, the Trinity, um, salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone, by 
according to the scriptures alone, for the glory of God alone, uh, about the second coming of Christ, about living a life that is pleasing to the Lord, about holy living, and a worldview that is conscious of Christ's imminent return. Is this world, is the, is Christ's imminent return part of our consciousness in our daily lives that it colors our worldview and the decisions that we make from day to day? Sometimes other things become more important. So maybe this Christ return is a very far away at the back of our mind. It's, it's there somewhere, but today I'm going to do something else, right? Today is not that day uh, to leave for Christ today because uh, my company, my, my, my firm, my, my, my career, my family, businesses, my, uh, I have that holiday lined up. None of these things are bad things. But when these things become the primary lens through which we view the world um, and that our worldview is absent of the consciousness of Christ's imminent return, then it is very easy for us to lose sight of why we are Christians in the first place. Why do we need to live a life that is countercultural? Uh, if the Lord is never coming back, if there is never judgment, uh, and we look at other people, their lives seems amazing and they don't live holy lives. They live absolutely according to their sinful passions and they seem to be having success at it. And it's very tempting to follow the same. But if we have a consciousness of Christ's imminent return, that would not be what attracts us. We will find that lifestyle unattractive because uh, our worldview uh, is, is colored by uh, the consciousness of Christ's imminent return. So that is in general. So at a personal level, we need to model for the next generation Christian faithfulness. Uh, growth in Christ likeness. Now it's important to be faithful to to not to not backslide, turn away from the Lord. But we cannot remain infantile in our knowledge of the Lord or our conformity to Christ. We need to grow in Christ likeness and uh, spiritual maturity, and that we do that by. Uh, 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 by Leaving out, practicing the spiritual habits that we were told, they were taught to practice, uh, to come to Christ um, uh, over and over um, every day. Confession of our sins, uh, reading of the word, uh, praying with the word, uh, just basically having communion and fellowship with Christ, um, fasting where we are a bit more desperate about that. Uh, spiritual discipline, some call that spiritual habits, others call that spiritual habits. That is at the personal level. And at the corporate level, we need to make every effort to ensure that our churches, our ministries, our families continue to be faithful and grow spiritually after our departure. Uh, 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 so that it is not just at the personal level, uh, at, the, at me and Jesus, me and Jesus, but also at the corporate level, uh, how are we doing in terms of ensuring our churches, ministries, and families continue to be faithful and grow spiritually after our departure? And that is something for us to think about the urgency of passing it on. Now we're gonna split into groups and here are some uh, questions you can basically um, uh, take a snapshot of this, take a picture of this, and I'm going to return the time to um, uh, to Wai Shong. I'm just going to read out the question number one. Have you been living in the light of the second coming of Christ? Or if they call it the kingdom that is to come, or that do I seek first the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is right here today, and the kingdom of God will be consummated when the Lord returns. It's the same thing. If yes, then share with each other for our mutual encouragement. How has this truth guided your life so that we can learn from one another? Again, we're about passing it on. So maybe pass on some, some tips as to how uh, this truth of living the life of second coming has guided your life. And if no, maybe if you are uh, 
transparent uh, or you're open to sharing, then what then is the controlling vision of your life if it is not this? Number two, share with each other the spiritual habits that you put into practice in order to develop Christ-like qualities. Now, if we, are, if we find our group to be quite quiet on question number two, then it also serves to expose us as to our lack of putting into practice spiritual habits in order to develop Christ-like qualities. And that provides a compass for our uh, spiritual life as to which direction we should go. Number three, are you willing to mentor or be mentored by somebody for growth in two things, knowledge of the scriptures and not just knowledge, but also holiness, spirituality. And number four, how can PJGH help you or your loved ones to grow in the knowledge of the scriptures and to pursue holiness? Okay, um, uh, Waishong. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, helping me today is Kelvin. So he will, we will now break up into uh, groups, uh, maybe about six or seven. Uh, and we will bring you back in 30 minutes where Stephen will do his final one to two minute round now uh, before I ask uh, Elder Paiket to close us in prayer. So if uh, we'll be breaking up into your groups right now for discussions, just appoint among uh, yourself uh, a, a leader to facilitate this discussion. Thank you.